Welcome, Dr. Jeffrey Morris. Dr. Morris is professor and director of the Division of Biostatistics at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He's been at Penn for a short while, having spent two decades at MD Anderson. Welcome to our From the Front Lines, Dr. Morris. Thank you, Steve. Well, you've done some fascinating work, which was introduced to me by my fellow regent and our vice chair of the Board of Regents, Dr. Scott Levin, who heads orthopedics there at Penn. Um, and Scott introduced this material, which I found absolutely fascinating. I'd like you to share with the listeners and viewers to our From the Frontline series a little bit about the coviddatascience.com. It's, it's a blog that you started on a website. Perhaps you could preface by saying, why did you start it and what is its purpose? Sure, yeah. Early in the pandemic, I noticed how difficult it was to evaluate all the fast accruing information and make sense of it, even, even for me as a statistical data scientist. So I started to post reliable and useful information on my social media pages to help my friends and family understand what was going on and discern what they should do. Then over time, I realized these efforts had general value and could have broader reach. And so I started this coviddatascience.com website and blog. Um, and so its, it's stated purpose is to use my perspective as a statistical data science scientist to evaluate constantly emerging COVID-19 information, filter out biases, aggregate information together, identify key insights, and then communicate them in an accessible and balanced way. Uh, so far, I've published uh, 146 blog posts on topics ranging from interpreting various data types, tracking viral spread, how to reopen safely, masks, debunking conspiracy theories, and updates on treatments, vaccines, and testing. Um, some key themes include finding middle ground between the extremes of denial and alarmism, overcoming the divisiveness in our modern society, and the construction of effective targeted mitigation strategies. Thanks. Uh, one of the things I came across when, when looking at your materials was wartime science. And perhaps you could expand upon that, that phrase you used. Biomedical research typically moves along slowly and methodically. Um, and if we followed the usual biomedical research procedures and timelines, the insights we discovered would arrive too late to help us with the millions of people who are currently being affected by the pandemic. Thus, circumstances dictate that we need to somehow move faster than we typically would, sort of an analogous fashion to wartime field medicine. But this brings with it risks, as we've seen with the number of retracted papers, changing advice, and unfruitful treatment leads. So this makes the rapid and careful evaluation and aggregation of the fast accruing information paramount as we move through the crisis. One of the things that you mentioned, and you mentioned it earlier in the interview too, about balance and, and balanced perspective, one of the balances with which we're struggling, and I'm, I'm speaking to you now uh, today, which is July 20th from, from Florida, which is certainly, uh, if not, it's an epicenter, if not the epicenter at the moment. So we're looking at a balance between lockdown and normal activity and, and, and somewhere in between for society to operate as normal. How do we achieve that balance? Yes, I think it, it's crucial that we maintain the right balance between viral control and the need to keep society going. Um, it's important to acknowledge the collateral damage that extended lockdowns can have on society, economically, socially, educationally, as well as on psychological and physical health. Um, it was never gonna be feasible to keep lockdowns in place long enough to eliminate viral spread. However, when lockdowns were lifted, some places pushed to quickly return to normal without the necessary safeguards or vigilance. And this has produced surges like Florida has seen that threaten to undo the progress made during the lockdowns. So I think the key is to find middle ground, which I consider the construction of targeted mitigation strategies that retain most of the effect of the lockdowns with far less collateral damage. That is a set of minimal steps that will effectively keep the viral spread under control, yet allow society to function as normally as possible. And I strongly believe that if we can achieve broad compliance, these strategies are sufficient to keep the virus under control and allow us to live our lives as normally as possible. But if we cannot achieve this compliance, 
are careless and allow surges, then more extreme measures may become necessary for a time in some locations to get the spread back under control. Speaking of spread, what can you tell us about the primary modes of spread? And perhaps you could be a bit more specific on some of the targeted mitigation strategies against that spread. Sure. Um, the, the CDC documents emphasize spread by respiratory droplets and infected surfaces. And that's motivated the social distancing and the disinfection guidelines that have comprised the primary mitigation strategies. Now, there is increasing evidence that the virus can potentially spread via smaller aerosol particles that stay in the air longer and travel further. But some doubt that this is a primary mode of the spread. Um, however, in crowded, poorly ventilated areas with recirculated air, there is potential for these particles to accumulate in the air. And so this pro possibility should probably be more strongly considered in constructing mitigation strategies. Also, studies have clearly shown outdoor spread is much less of a risk than indoors and have also highlighted that the time factor is really important. Brief exposure is much less likely to produce an infection than sustained exposure over time. So given what we've learned, the evidence suggests that it's key to avoid spending long periods of time in crowded indoor settings, especially if poorly ventilated, while practicing social distancing and avoiding contact with public surfaces as much as possible. You've mentioned surfaces, and you've, but you've also mentioned droplets and spoken about closed versus open spaces. Where do masks fit into that overall gamut? Yeah, masks are a key part of, of this. Numerous epidemiological and experimental studies have emerged that demonstrate the efficacy of mask wearing to reduce respiratory and aerosol spread. So even though surgical or cloth masks allow some viral particles through, they reduce the viral load exhaled or inhaled, thus reducing the likelihood of infection. Uh, the CDC director recently suggested that universal mask wearing could get the pandemic under control in four to six weeks. So I'm not sure if mask wearing is sufficient, but it's clearly an easy step that can be a major factor in keeping viral spread under control and should be universally practiced. Thank you. I, it's interesting how that topic has become uh, politicized, if nothing else. Uh, there's a lot of data floating around out there, and you yourself said it. You started your, your blog and you started your website to try and distill down this plethora of data. So we hear about data on hospitalizations, on intensive care unit beds, on deaths, on, uh, on clusters of, of cases, on, on, on uh, pandemic and epidemic areas. How do you tease it all down? I mean, which of these data can we best use to assess emerging outbreaks before they become full-blown outbreaks? Well, and I, I think to understand what's going on in the pandemic and get a complete picture, all of these measurements provide some insight, so they need to be looked at together. Um, when it comes to identifying outbreaks early, cases and testing are the key, um, but outbreaks can't be detected by case counts alone, since case counts will naturally go up with increases in testing, um, we need to also look at the test positivity rate along with case counts to discern whether an increase is truly indicating an uptick or surge in infections. Um, hospitalizations and deaths are also important to understand the pandemic. Um, hospitalizations are key since a major goal of our mitigation strategies is to keep them from being overwhelmed. And as we can see in, in some places in the South and West that are surging, they can quickly become overwhelmed and eventually lead to preventable deaths. But one problem is hospital data is less widely available um, than other types of data. And also hospitalizations is not very useful as a leading indicator of surges since the hospitalizations are lagged several weeks after infections. Um, deaths are also important to look at, but are also tricky to interpret. Um, it's difficult to get the attribution exactly right Plus deaths are even more lagged behind cases, so they don't go up right away. And the death rate depends heavily on the demographics. So for example, the current surge um, that we're seeing in Florida and other places in the South is, has a high proportion of young adults. They themselves have a very low death rate, but the surge is increasing the viral prevalence in society. So eventually as it spreads through, through um, 
society, it'll invariably reach more vulnerable populations and will produce more deaths. So that's where we have to interpret these things very carefully in a nuanced fashion. I know towards that end, you're working on a variety of, of modeling. And, and I know that you're working with a, a policy lab group at Children's Hospital um, and developing some, some models. Can you tell us what the models entail or what you expect they're ultimately going to predict? Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so yeah, we cl collaborated with this group led by David Rubin at CHOP that set out to model and project COVID-19 incidents at the county level. My junior uh, UPenn colleague, Jing Huang, has led the development of um, some hybrid statistical epidemiological models to identify community factors that predict cases and generate county level projections to identify emerging hotspots. So the model works by estimating the effective reproductive number um, for each county over time and then through a sophisticated statistical model relates this number to temperature, population density, social distancing practices in the county, testing positivity rates, and county specific time trends that measure momentum. Um, so then this model can be used to provide county level incidence projections that are useful for identifying emerging outbreaks and hotspots. Um, the model has provided accurate early predictions of emerging hotspots in Houston and other locations around the country and has generated a great deal of interest among the media and policymakers alike. Um, Deborah Burks and the White House pandemic response team is using the model projections produced each, each week as a primary source to inform their efforts to identify hotspots and work with community leaders to address them. Well, that's very impressive. Congratulations on getting that type of attention to your project. You mentioned during your last response, two separate groups of people, one the media and the second policymakers. Uh, if I can get you to editorialize, uh, perhaps, what do you think the media are doing well? What do you think the policymakers and government are doing well? And what do you think they should do differently? Well, I think the key is for them to send a consistent, balanced message, avoiding the extremes of denial and alarmism. Um, in the media, I think editors and producers may tend towards alarmism as this tends to sell. Um, but with this in mind, I think scientists and clinicians interviewed need to help moderate the message and focus it on the key insights that are clearly supported by the data. Um, in terms of government officials, I, I have tremendous sympathy for the difficulty of their job. Um, they have to somehow wade through all of this fast accruing information and make decisions that affect large amounts of people and account for the ditches on both sides of the road. You, you know, there, a lot of times there's not a simple solution on what they should do. Um, and overall, I think they're trying hard to get it right. But I think the government's fallen short in many ways in terms of coordination as well as communication. Um, and especially in terms of communication, I think society needs leaders to provide a balanced message that clearly communicates the seriousness of what we're facing yet optimism that working together, we can manage this crisis and get through it. And they need to clearly communicate the new information as it emerges with transparency and humility, acknowledging past mistakes and explaining why recommendations are changing over time. These steps are needed to build trust with the public, which is necessary to get compliance with the directives. Unfortunately, I think this has been ex done exceptionally poorly in general. And I consider this to be the biggest failure of leadership during this crisis and a major reason why we're not handling it well as a country. Well, thank you for those reflections. And th the last question I'd like to ask you is that surgeons are leaders. Uh, surgeons tend to be leaders locally at their institutions, nationally in, in, in societies, internationally. And, and although we don't necessarily make policy, we might potentially be able to, to influence policy we can do our part in our communication. So how do you think we should be messaging what's going on based upon the information you have? I, I think a key, a key is to send a balanced message and to recognize that this is a difficult situation and there's different perspectives. Um, some people are more concerned about the collateral damage provided um, by our mitigation strategies. Other people are more concerned about the surge. So I think we need to recognize that people on these two sides need to respect each other and, um, and not vilify the other perspectives. I see 
um, division between these two extremes as being a major problem in our society in general. I just wrote a big blog post yesterday on that, the deniers against the alarmists. But, but I think in, as leaders and in terms of our messaging, being able to try to bring people together to recognize that we really all want the same thing here. Um, nobody wants this virus to spread out of control and wants any hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and at the same time, nobody wants the economy or people's lives to be messed up. So everybody wants the same thing. So I think communicating sort of a message, um, kind of of unity to acknowledge the different perspectives, but to try and bring them together, um, I think is the most important thing. Well, the American College of Surgeons is well known for being collaborative and, and for convening and, and getting people around the table to talk and, and being the voice of reason. Our executive director, Dave Hoyt, is, is legendary for his ability to get people to see common ground, to discuss issues. So I hope we can follow your advice and I hope that we can collectively and individually uh, do exactly what you said we, we should be doing. I, I commend you and congratulate you, Dr. Morris, on your research. I, I thank you for taking your time today to share some of the work with us for the American College Surgeons from the front lines for our ACS Bulletin Brief. I wish you sustained health in this pandemic. Great. You too, Dr. Wexner. Thank you.